grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim Miller. By the grace of God, I serve as pastor of St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, Illinois, St. Luke's Covington, and at Trinity St. John Lutheran School, Nashville, Illinois. Thank you for tuning in to our Bible class. Let's pray. Almighty God, in your mercy, so guide the course of this world that we may forgive as we have been forgiven and joyfully serve you in godly peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without your help, our labor is useless, and without your light, our search is in vain. Invigorate our study of your Holy Word, that by due diligence and right discernment, we may be established by your Spirit in your holy faith, and be equipped to share it with others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In Matthew chapter 18, we have heard of Jesus' care for the little ones. Remember the chapter started with Jesus speaking to the question the disciples were talking about, who is the greatest? Last week, we heard Jesus teaching about what to do when our brother sins against us and how we are to deal with others in such a way as to win them back for the Lord Jesus and thereby also restore the broken relationship. Let's listen again to Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. Jesus said, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. All this talk of care for others and winning them back brings Peter to follow up with a question. So here's the new section, Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Well, no doubt Peter thought he was being pretty generous when he said as many as seven times. He was telling the Lord, yes, I will forgive my brother. I will forgive him repeatedly, but I don't have to forgive him indefinitely, do I? Jesus answered, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. The old King James Version said 70 times 7, which would be 490 times. More recent scholars seem to favor 77 times. The original Greek could be taken either way, and really the point is the same either way. They both make the point that the number is so large that one should not try to count the times, but always continue to forgive. We're not being commanded to count, but to forgive without counting. Just keep on forgiving those who sin against you, just as God forgives us. One wonders if Peter had someone in particular in mind who had repeatedly sinned against him. Was it one of the hired hands who used to work for him in the fishing business and stole or was lazy on the job? Was it that mother-in-law of his that Jesus had healed from a fever? Maybe his wife, who perhaps got tired of being married to such a big talker. Could it have been James or John, the sons of thunder, or one of the other disciples who were getting on his nerves as they traveled around? Well, as we proceed, it may be helpful for us this morning to have in mind someone in our own life who is difficult to forgive. Each of us have someone or several 
in our lives who have hurt us, and it's just hard to let go of it. Maybe someone in the family doesn't understand or even stabbed us in the back. Maybe someone at work or school treated us unfairly. Maybe someone in the neighborhood. Maybe even someone at our church. If we've had someone sin against us, and we all have, then this parable is for us. In this parable, we see that the forgiven forgive. Just as Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Those who have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus will forgive brothers and sisters who sin against them. Jesus explains with a parable. Matthew 18, beginning at verse 23. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. The parable begins with a day of reckoning. The first thing to understand here is that the time will come when our king will settle accounts with all his servants. God is the king and we're all accountable to him. Every person is accountable to the Lord who made them. A person may not believe that there is a Lord who has made them, they may fool themselves into believing that they can set their own rules and standards and are accountable to no one. But the truth remains, 2 Corinthians 5, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. The truth is that each one of us will be called at some point to stand before the Lord as judge. He'll settle accounts. It will happen when our time on this earth comes to an end, either through death or through the end of the world. What will the Lord find? Well, what did he find with this servant in the parable? Now, remember, in the parables, Jesus uses common everyday things, but often there is one detail that is totally unrealistic in terms of human life and relationships. In this case, it's the huge debt that the first servant owes. How in the world could one man run up a debt so large? 10,000 talents is a huge sum. In our day, it would not be like a car loan or a mortgage on your home or business. It's more like the national debt. In Matthew 20, we find out that one denarius was often a day's wage. And by one account, one talent was worth 6,000 thousand denarii. In other words, if it were possible for this guy to work 365 days a year, it would still take him 164,384 years for him to repay the debt. That is a ridiculously large sum. And that's the sum that Jesus chose to represent the sins that we've committed against our Heavenly Father. Each sin we commit runs up a debt with our Father in heaven. In Matthew 6, Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our debts. Remember, he is the king to whom we're accountable. He's entirely just and fair. He's given us commands about what we're to do and not to do. He's our maker. He has the authority to demand that we, to demand that we keep his commandments perfectly. Every time we fail in our thoughts, our words, our deeds, this is added to the debt that we owe. He himself is eyewitness to each one of our misdeeds. He's able to keep track of them all and come up with a complete itemized bill for what we owe against him. We have run up a ridiculously large debt with our Father in heaven. David, the psalmist, said, Psalm 40, My iniquities have overtaken me. They are more than the hairs of my head. As we say in the Catechism, we daily sin much and indeed deserve nothing but punishment. There are many sins we commit that are a slap in the face of the Holy God, and we might not even realize that they're sins. Well, what does the king do? The king is just, he's fair, 
He believes in settling things in a fair way, so in line with the laws of that day, he gives the command that the man and all he has be sold until the debt is repaid. What does it say about us? Before the judgment seat of Christ, it says, we deserve to go to hell for all eternity. That's the just and fair response to our sinful lives. But wonder of wonders, this is not how the reckoning ends. Jesus continues, so the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. God has, through his only begotten Son, released us of our debt. In 1 Peter 1 it says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as gold or silver, that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. 2 Corinthians 8, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, Ephesians 1. The word redeemer is a word that has to do with buying and selling. It was someone who paid a price to buy someone out of slavery. Jesus paid the price to buy us out of slavery, to sin, death, and the power of the devil, the devil, that great accuser. There's no price tag that can be put on the payment he made. It's the precious blood of the eternal Son of God, sufficient to pay for the guilt of every human being who ever lived or ever will live. Through faith and trust in Jesus Christ, this gift, this payment, is counted toward us. In view of this payment, the Father has canceled all that debt of ours. He guaranteed it by raising Christ from the dead. Heaven is ours. Christ's holiness is counted as ours. We're free. What a wonderful turn of events for the servant with the huge debt. What a wonderful turn of events for us. Now, another way of describing the forgiveness of sins that Jesus has earned for us is to call it the rest that we find in Jesus. Here the students at the Lutheran Theological College of Uganda sing about that rest in the hymn, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. I heard the voice of Jesus say,
This news of God's forgiveness and rest is wonderful, but we've only heard half the parable. There's still another scene. We continue Matthew 18, verses 28 to 35. But when that same servant went out, the one who had been forgiven the enormous debt, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. How sad! The words of the king's grace and mercy and forgiveness were still ringing in his ears when he went to his fellow servant and grabbed him by the throat to get him to pay back his debt. How large was that debt? Well, a hundred denarii. Now that's more than pocket change. It was a genuine loss. It would take about a hundred work days to earn enough to pay it back. But that could be done. That was realistic. And yet 100 denarii was just one sixtieth of one talent. So this debt was something like one millionth of the debt that the king had canceled for him. When people sin against us, those sins are real. They hurt. It's not pretend or fake or just in our imagination. There's a real debt. But it is a small debt compared to the huge debt against us that God, our heavenly King, has canceled in view of the payment of Christ, our Redeemer. How sad it is if God's people would leave a house of worship with the words of God's absolution, his forgiveness ringing in their ears, and then go out and refuse to forgive their neighbor. How tragic if we're to leave God's house with the taste of the sacrament of Christ's forgiveness still on our lips and yet bear a grudge in our hearts. How unfitting to come to God's house to sing praises for his forgiveness and then withhold that forgiveness from others. Medical studies have actually shown that practicing forgiveness leads to better health. A website from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota reported that letting go of grudges and bitterness can make way for happiness, health, and peace. Forgiveness can lead to healthier relationships, greater spiritual and psychological well-being, less anxiety, stress, and hostility, lower blood pressure, fewer symptoms of depression, stronger immune system, improved heart health, and higher self-esteem. Well, this should come as no surprise to the Christian. The parable says that the last, at the last, the servant who refused to forgive was delivered to the jailers, more literally, torturers. It was a torture totally unnecessary and of his own making. Jesus adds, So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. It's a solemn warning that those who stubbornly refuse to forgive from the heart will thereby bring about their own eternal damnation in hell. And, no doubt, to wake us up before it is too late, it seems that the Lord has designed our bodies in such a way that a taste of this torture may begin already in this life. We do harm to our own bodies when we stubbornly refuse to let go of resentment, bitterness, and a desire for revenge. But how do we forgive when it is so often so difficult? Well, here are three observations drawn largely from Dr. Jeff Gibbs. He says, the first thing to emphasize is this, God takes the initiative in Christ Jesus. The parable is told by Jesus to his disciples. He has called them, and on the strength of his word, they are already following him. The first scene comes first. God's forgiveness is always first and foundational. It is never earned 
or elicited or merited or in any way or to any extent the result of anything in us or done by us. Jesus paid the penalty. Second, it is helpful to distinguish between the decision to forgive another person and the internal emotions that a Christian may or may not experience in relation to another person. The verb to forgive, used repeatedly in the parable here, has to do with releasing. To forgive is to release someone else from the retribution and retaliation that they may very well deserve. This is something that only believers can do, and when they decide to frame things in the context and flow of God's forgiveness, even when part of them, the old Adam or sinful nature, does not want to and cannot do it. In other words, forgiveness can be seen as a choice led by the Holy Spirit, an act of the regenerated will of a disciple, and the emotions may, however, slowly follow along in agreement, or they may need to be dragged kicking and screaming into the new situation. So when you've already forgiven someone, you may still from time to time experience emotions of hostility or anxiety. In that case, do not doubt the fact of God's unlimited forgiveness for yourself in Jesus Christ, nor should you doubt that the other person is truly forgiven. Remember, Jesus promised early in the chapter, whatever you loose, that is, untie or free, on earth shall be loosed, more literally, shall have been loosed in heaven. So emotions may cloud the mind and heart, but they cannot trump the promises of God. And third, we may need to keep hearing the words of forgiveness repeatedly. Before God, as our conscience accuses us, it's the word of forgiveness, such as we have in the absolution, that will silence the accusing voice of our enemy, the devil, that great accuser. The Bible is filled with assurances that when the God of Israel, the one true and triune God, does forgive, he forgives completely and utterly. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Psalm 103. Although our conscience and acquaintances may keep reminding us of our transgressions, there's no need for God to forgive the same sins over and over again. Christ died once for all time. Yet for our comfort, we may need to hear it again and again. I think of the inmate at the correctional center who says he knows that God has forgiven him, but he says he has trouble forgiving himself for all the hurt he has brought upon his loved ones. Let that man continue and repeatedly hear of God's forgiveness for him. And when it comes to other people, for example, when there's been a long-standing wound and hurt, we also may find it helpful to speak and hear again and again words of confession and forgiveness. This is one of the most beautiful and helpful things Christian friends and Christian spouses can do one for the other. When a sin causes wounds that take years to heal, or perhaps scars that will be evident until the end of this earthly life, the process of healing and restoration for all persons involved may take repeated mutual confessions and absolutions. As the portrait of the disciples in Matthew reveals, and as the teaching of the New Testament epistles makes clear, there is ever and always a struggle going on in Jesus' disciples, a struggle between the ways of the old evil age and the powers of the new time of salvation into which we have been called and baptized. In other words, we keep turning back to God and marveling in the free gift of Jesus. We go back into the throne room and remember again and again how our Heavenly Father has canceled all that debt of ours. Treasure the sacrifice of Jesus for you. Think about it. Meditate how much God has given you. Pray to him for a forgiving heart. He will surely hear that prayer and melt our cold, stubborn hearts. In Christ and in him alone, the forgiven forgive. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer, led in song by the children from Trinity St. John Lutheran School, accompanied by Mrs. Janice Lange.
receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You've been listening to the Bible study from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, Illinois. This is Pastor Tim Miller. Please join us next Sunday, God willing, as we continue our study of Matthew. And if you don't have a church home, we invite you to join us sinners at St. John's, where the gifts of Christ's forgiveness and salvation are offered every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Who will be elected our president? Only God knows. But whoever is elected to a four-year term, Jesus is our king forever. He urges us to pray for our leaders who are placed over us. Join us in a service of prayer and preaching with lots of singing to God, petitioning him to have mercy on the USA, thanking him for his gifts. That's today, Sunday, October 13th at 3 o'clock at St. John's, New Minden. Mrs. Karen Shimkus will serve as guest organist with Pastor Timothy Shar giving the message. Pastor Shar formerly served as pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church, Nashville. He's currently president of the Southern Illinois District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The service will be preceded by a half hour of chamber music by Karen Shimkus and friends in the St. John's Memorial Chapel beginning at 2.30 p.m. A portion of the offering will support the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty, the presence of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod in Washington, D.C. And today we thank Lee Sutmeyer, who has sponsored the broadcast to the glory of God. We're grateful for those who have stepped forward to help us with this. And we thank our good partners at V1047, who put us on the air every week. They're the best. And thank you for listening.